copy roll call gary hertzberg here chris selner here sam kaufman here phil willems here nyla fry here aaron moran bill ranham thank you okay first thing we have is confirmation of open meeting compliance public postings official notices and online availability I can confirm that um, the village board agenda was posted okay, thank appropriately. You, thank you, Sue. Then we have under presentations, community aquatic facilities planning concept presentation by Councilman Hunsaker. Here we go. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. So welcome everybody um, on this cold night to talk about swimming in a warm pool. It's um, a good thing to look forward to perhaps. So I just wanna start with a little bit of an introduction. My name is Sue McDade. I'm the community services director here in the village. And um, we welcome you to this conversation again tonight. It's a continuing conversation that's been going on in the village for a very long time. I look back to almost 21 years ago when I came to work first for the village and on the um, spring election, was a referendum about a swimming pool. Um, that um, referendum failed and it's been 20 years now that we and the village have been wondering if this conversation was gonna start up again. Over the last several years, we've done quite a bit of surveying of people in our community as far as their wants and needs for parks and recreation. And one of the things that comes up very often on a very high positive scale is the idea of some kind of public aquatics facility. About two years ago, we were in this very room. Um, we hired a local consulting firm to come and just survey the community about how they felt about aquatics here in the village. And more than a hundred people came. It was a very um, exciting electric night. And there was a lot of good conversation about options for aquatics in the village. As a staff team, we moved forward. We did some research. We had a lot of conversations. Um, and we worked, um, sent out an RFP, and thought we had a planning firm that we were going to recommend to the board to come in and help us decide what kind of a facility we would build and where it would go, all of those great details. And then COVID hit. And as you know, with everything in our lives, a lot of things got set aside and clearly that conversation was not a priority. Um, in fact, we couldn't even get together to talk about it. So two years later, we really put our thinking caps on again and tried to decide what should our next steps be. We were hearing from the community like, hey, what happened? Like we had that great meeting and there was such great energy. And, and what's happening with swimming? So we, we put some more thought into it. And while the firm that we originally thought we were gonna bring on board is a great, great group of people, great park planners, they did not have the international background in aquatics that we really felt that we needed. Um, so we reached out to a lot of different people that know a lot about aquatics and said, who, can help us. Who knows more about aquatics than anybody? We need somebody who can not learn with us, but lead us. Um, and we are very, very fortunate to have with us George Dynas from Councilman Hunsaker. Um, George is actually um, located out of Texas. Um, so it's probably pretty cold here for him right now. And if he says to you, y'all, you'll understand that he's from Texas. Um, the village board approved a contract with Councilman Hunsaker back in September. And since that time, we have been very busy reaching out to the community and trying to um, learn more about what the community now thinks about aquatics. We did a community-wide survey. George will tell us about the results tonight, but 1,600 people were involved in that community-wide survey. We hosted um, stakeholder groups where we invited people in to talk to us in very small groups, people that were already 
connected and invested in aquatics in our village. We invited them in to talk about how they thought um, a new facility would or wouldn't be a good fit for the village. We also put together what we called our aquatics work group, which was a group of nine people from a very um, diverse set of backgrounds throughout the village. Many of those people are with us here tonight and they have been involved in several additional meetings working with George on thoughts and ideas about what direction we're gonna take with aquatics here in the village. So all of that work tonight, we're super excited to have the village board here to be able to share George's work with us. Um, he has a great presentation. Um, Todd's gonna talk a little bit about like what's next and what we're hoping to um, get out of tonight's meeting. But one just notice of um, process. We really need, if you're going to speak tonight, we ask that you speak into one of the microphones. Um, it's a small group and we probably could holler at each other, um, but we are um, taping this meeting and to most accurately get our voices into that tape. So people who wanna watch at a later date can do that. We need you to use the microphone so your voice is captured. So Jeff and I will help. We'll, we'll hop around and share the microphone. If necessary, Village Board, you have a couple to share as well. So with that said, it's your turn, Todd. Thank, thanks, Sue. Good, good start. Appreciate the background there. Um, thanks everybody for coming. My name is Todd Schmidt. I'm the Village Administrator in Wanakee. And just um, kind of a quick note, I'm, I'm looking all the way across at my bosses over there, <laughs> my Village Board. So my first comment is for, for you guys in terms of what really is expected to, to, uh, tonight um, or what isn't expected tonight. Um, what George is gonna be sharing is the, and the result of the research is going to show you, um, I, I hesitate, I'm not gonna say what community wants. I'm gonna say it's gonna demonstrate community preferences. Um, we did do some survey research as part of this process, but it's, it wasn't a scientific survey per se. So it's hard for me to, any of us to stand here and say, this is what the community wants. Um, I know that Chris, and maybe you'll talk about this later, has indicated the desire to go to referendum on that, on the question of aquatics when we're prepared to ask. That's really gonna give you the, what does the community entirely want? So what you're hearing tonight is gonna be about preferences that we've discovered, as well as market need and capacity within our community. So those, those are the really important things that we're gonna be learning about tonight. I also want to indicate that um, there, there isn't pressure upon you board members to make a decision this evening. If there is a, a point of pressure, if we desire to have a question on this coming April's referendum ballot, we would need to determine the question by January 18th. So that second, second board meeting in January is when that final decision would need to be made. Um, but as for tonight, uh, most important is to uh, gain information from George, digest that, ask questions for clarification. Um, and Chris, I did ask you earlier, you are willing to welcome public comments should there be any. And will you, you'll take the lead at uh, informing the, the crowd when those are welcome? Yes. Okay, great. That's all I have then. Um, I'll turn it over to George. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, I don't wanna get in trouble, but I will show you what I look like. I just, I find that when I, I've been meeting with people for, for months and months and I see them in person and I don't really know what they look like. And then I see them on Zoom and I'm like, oh, that's, that's what they look like. Okay, so I find it helps you be more comfortable with me if you actually know uh, what, I, what I look like from the, the nose down. So uh, as Sue and uh, Todd mentioned, my name is George Dinas. I work for Councilman Hunsaker and we do aquatic facility uh, planning and design. Uh, we have quite a bit of information to share. So I will do my best uh, to be efficient with everybody's time, but also uh, to be thorough as well. And so uh, what we'd like to do today is just share about our process, our market research, our community engagement, uh, share our uh, initial options for consideration uh, along with the capital uh, and operational costs, and then uh, open it up for uh, questions and answers from the board and then uh, any comments from uh, the public. And so as we look at our feasibility study, uh, we essentially have three buckets that we run with. 
uh, starting with the needs assessment. And this is us researching the community, uh, as Sue mentioned, meeting with the community uh, to determine what those aquatic needs are. Uh, from that, uh, we put together several plans for considerations, spatial requirements, cost considerations on the, the capital side. Uh, and then lastly, we look at the, the operations. How do these pools, uh, how do we project those pools to operate uh, as you look into the future? And so uh, our primary goal is to, uh, which we have done is meet with the different aquatic user groups. So we find that uh, community members use pools for uh, recreation, competition, instruction, or wellness and therapy. Uh, and so We've done our best to listen well to, to the community, to try to uh, figure out uh, if any of those groups, uh, you know, what is the biggest preference out of those four groups, but then also to be, uh, you know, efficient and be able to multi-purpose the pools. Uh, Cause a lot of times the same pool can meet the user group needs of, of three of those groups and sometimes all four. And so uh, we've done our best to try to make sure that the pools can be multi-purpose for uh, the different aquatic user groups. Uh, as we start to, uh, you know, talk about the community engagement side of our project, you know, we found uh, from multiple groups that yes, swim lessons are essential. There are uh, availability of swim lessons through the, the high school pool, both during the year and during their uh, summer school, Little Stroke Swim Academy uh, also offers swim lessons on a year round basis. Uh, we really heard that recreational swimming is lacking, uh, both on the uh, seasonal outdoor pool side, but also throughout the year. Uh, but we did hear a lot of folks that drive to uh, Lodi and Sun Prairie and Middleton for outdoor aquatic experiences uh, during the summertime. Uh, and while you do have an eight lane, 25 uh, yard pool here in Wanakee at the high school, uh, it has really limited uh, hours of availability for uh, the community. And so only being open from uh, 5.30 to 8 in the morning, uh, there's really not a lot of, uh, you know, uh, access for the general public. And you're just relegated to those two and a half hours uh, in the morning time. Uh, one of the other things we heard is that, you know, we should think about uh, equity within an aquatics facility. Uh, and so we do know that there's 275 uh, families that are considered low income here in uh, Wanakee, but then also uh, less than 40% actually have access to community pools through the different uh, neighborhood associations. So uh, at one point we thought it might be a little bit higher than that, uh, just based on the feedback we had received, but then looking at uh, the demographics, the number of households in each of those uh, you know, each of those neighborhoods, we found it's actually uh, lower than uh, 40%. Uh, we also heard we want to uh, plan for the future, not just take into consideration, you know, how big Wanakee is now, but also how big it will be uh, within the future. Uh, and then I mentioned, you know, having uh, a pool that, that meets everyone's needs. And that can be difficult at times, but I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, we've come up with some options that can at least help to uh, get us closer to, to providing something uh, for everyone. Uh, in terms of community uh, competitive swimming, we talked about the community with the high school and the uh, neighborhood association pools and other communities. On the competition side, you know, we have uh, the high school boys and girls team. We have the wave uh, club team. We do know that the high school has received uh, numerous requests for uh, from other groups within the greater Madison area to rent uh, lane time at the indoor uh, competition pool. Uh, but as we started to, to look at, you know, the competitive need uh, versus the existing pool, you know, it is an eight lane, 25 yard competition pool. It has spectator seating for, I think, 250 to, to 350 folks. Uh, to go larger than that, we would need to start off with a baseline of a, of a 10 lane pool and probably 500 spectator seats. And so uh, we do feel that there is some, there would be some duplication if we went with a straight uh, competition pool that could, could host larger meets. And while that would be uh, a great thing, I'm, I'm not sure if it would, you know, be exactly what uh, would be needed because we'd still need to complement it with some other uh, bodies of water. Uh, we also put out a survey 
uh, to the community uh, back in October. Uh, got over 1,500 responses, 85% of those live in the village. Uh, close to 70% were in that 35 to uh, 54 range. Then we had close to 70% had three or more people living in their household. We asked a variety of questions uh, about the types of pools uh, that they would like to see. Uh, so we asked a, a scaling preference, one being uh, you know, on the low end, three being on the high end. So anytime you see uh, a lot of yellow, that means that there was a high preference uh, so the, uh, both the outdoor and the indoor pools were highly preferred, uh, but you can see the difference between the recreation uh, and the competition uh, preference uh, right here, that, that preference toward recreational uh, water was uh, pretty substantial. Uh, we also took a stab at some individual uh, amenity types and, you know, looked at anything from a, a zero depth entry to water slides, to fitness lap lane, shade and party areas, a spray pad, children's play area, uh, just to get a feel for what types of amenities we would include if it were a uh, recreational uh, facility. Uh, we looked at types of programs and we put out a sampling of different uh, aquatic programs that, that I would say are typical to community aquatic facilities like the one that we're looking at here. Uh, swim lessons, recreational swimming, and, and fitness uh, were at the high end, and then adult lap swim and water aerobics, uh, you know, were there as well. Uh, but again, you know, our goal would be to, to not just create a facility that can just have these, but that can accommodate, you know, a wider array of programs. Uh, so that gave us a snapshot into to what the community is thinking. We also got a lot of uh, open-ended uh, comments, you know, I think over six or 700, uh, some in favor of a community aquatics facility, uh, some not in favor of a community aquatics facility, but we did have an open-ended comment section uh, where we could, you know, just anything that was not asked specifically, we would allow uh, comments in that array. Uh, we also take a look at uh, demographics throughout our process uh, knowing that, you know, the village has close to 14,000 people. It's growing at a, about a rate of 7% uh, per year. Uh, we do know that there are uh, a lot of young families. That's what this chart shows. It shows a lot of children in the, the ranges of ages 5 to 15, and then a lot of uh, you know, parents in that 35 to 54 range. Uh, and then we also know that the uh, while there are, you know, some lower income families in Wanaki, we do know that uh, there is also, uh, you know, a good number of families that are above the national average for the median household income, which right now is about $53,000 uh, or just, just under that. Uh, we looked at area aquatic facilities, you know, both on the indoor and outdoor side. And so uh, there's a lot of different facilities within the area that I'll just scroll through uh, briefly, but, you know, from spray pads to indoor competition uh, to outdoor recreation, uh, plus you have the Mecca of indoor water parks within about an hour's drive uh, from you all at the Dells. Um, and then we, you know, plot them on a map, but you can see that, you know, there is a bit of a gap over here. We do have the, the neighborhood uh, pools uh, here in Wanaki, but you know, there is a bit of a gap over there. And so uh, we could definitely see a facility in this area, uh, not being just, not catering just to the village, but having uh, outsiders uh, come in. And so, uh, you know, what takes about four to, to five weeks of, of research, I, I just covered in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, but what we do is we, we take all that and we uh, tie that in with our uh, aquatics expertise and really work to come up with several different options for the village to consider. Uh, we would not see these being final options at this point. Uh, they, are, they are options. They are options to, to discuss, uh, to provide comment and feedback on. And so uh, we would expect some changes uh, to be made uh, to the different options that we have uh, come up with. And so uh, as we look at the first option, uh, we went solely with an outdoor aquatic facility, you know, so we would expect Memorial Day to Labor Day uh, would be the, the season 
Uh, and usually, you know, in this area of the country, it could still be kind of chilly on Memorial Day. And so maybe it's, it's June 10th to, to Labor Day, somewhere in there. But uh, we started out with a uh, large outdoor leisure pool, about 7,000 square feet. So we have a, a, a zero beach entry with an aquatic clay structure. And I'll have some representative images uh, for each of these here in just a minute. Uh, we have a uh, lounge deck here in the middle. Uh, we have some open water rec area. We have, uh, we're calling bench seating now, more of a passive area, but we could also do uh, water basketball. We could do a floatable uh, crossing activity. There's a variety of uh, activities that we could do there. We have a dual water slide tower uh, on uh, the right side. And then we're showing a six lane, 25 yard uh, lap slash recreational pool. And so uh, we'd have the ability for the village to have a uh, competitive summer league uh, swim team. Uh, could also have a water slide, could have a climbing wall over here, could have some other shallow water uh, recreational features. We'd see both of these pools uh, being heated during the summertime. Uh, typically in this area, you know, they keep them about 82 degrees uh, during the summer. Uh, just to, to keep it from being uh, too chilly. And then we have uh, support spaces as well. You know, some examples of uh, entryway, locker room, storage mechanical, concession stand, and then uh, office areas. Uh, so when we look at, you know, a, a typical zero uh, depth entry with some uh, play elements. Uh, we have an open water uh, area, like I showed, that could have some bench seating uh, in it. Uh, dual water slide tower, maybe it's an open and enclosed flume. These range in height, you know, this one's a little bit uh, shorter. This is probably 15 uh, to, to 18 feet tall. You know, we can, we can go a little bit higher, we can go a little bit lower. Uh, you can do bright colors, you can do muted colors. Uh, there's uh, all sorts of options that can be done with any of the aquatic uh, play amenities. Uh, six lane, uh, 25 yard lap pool, you know, this shows one that has, both has a diving board uh, as well as a climbing wall, but they're having a swim meet and you can see the number of people uh, that are at the outdoor swim meet uh, during the summertime. And then here's an example of what that lounge bench uh, could look like. So we have some in-water uh, lounge chairs uh, on a shelf and uh, parents can sit there and uh, watch their kids uh, go by. Uh, so that's the first option. The second option, we uh, married the indoor and the outdoor components. And so uh, one of the things that we heard was definitely a strong preference for outdoor recreational aquatics. Uh, but behind that was pretty closely, what you saw by the survey results was uh, indoor, uh, indoor aquatics as well. And so uh, not only on the recreational side, but on the, the wellness and fitness side, again, with the high school only being open for two and a half hours a day, uh, you know, we heard a lot of comments that it'd be nice to have those other wellness and fitness activities uh, throughout the day. And so uh, we took the leisure pool from the uh, outdoor side, uh, but then we placed it next to an indoor uh, leisure program pool that has a variety of amenities. Uh, so we're showing four 25 yard lap lanes. So this could be uh, lap lanes. It could be open water area for water fitness on the weekends. It could be recreational area. It could be half and half. It could be two lap lanes and then some, some open water uh, area. Uh, we have a current channel here. Uh, so uh, think lazy river, but think on a, a micro, uh, micro scale. Very good for uh, recreational activity, but also uh, for fitness. We do a lot of these in uh, fitness uh, centers where people come and walk against the current. Uh, and then we also have a uh, shallow water children's play area. So a little bit smaller uh, than this type of play feature. Uh, and then we have the necessary uh, support spaces, you know, with the lockers, admin. Uh, we're showing a party room uh, right here. We would see that one of the big uh, revenue generators for this facility would be uh, birthday parties, uh, you know, weeknights or most likely weekends. And so uh, the one big difference here is that, uh, you know, we'd obviously have the, the water heated for the outdoor pool during the summertime, uh, but then during the indoor pool, we'd see this probably being an 85 to 86 degree pool, <coughs> excuse me, based upon uh, the types of users, you know, swim lessons, water fitness, 
uh, fitness lap lane, uh, swim, fitness lap swimming, and then uh, the recreational component. Uh, you know, you start to look at the competition pool uh, on the indoor side, you'd probably want that at 80 to 82 degrees, um, which is great for the competitive swimmers, but then it's, it's too, too cold for the, the kids in swim lessons. They'll have blue lips at the end of it. And so uh, with this pool, the user base that we'd be looking at, it'd probably be 85 to 86. Uh, so, you know, with 85 degree water, maybe the, the seven to eight year old competitive swimmers, uh, it would suffice, but probably by the time they get to be nine to 10, that water is going to be uh, too hot to, to run practices uh, in there. Uh, some other representative images, again, another uh, type of children's uh, play structure on the outdoor side. We have the, uh, the Green Bay Packers uh, water slide uh, right here with an open and an enclosed flume. Uh, very similar in uh, size and scale to what we're showing is this pool. This has three lap lanes. It's got the, the children's play. Um, it's got the current channel here uh, in the middle. Uh, again, another sample with a, this one has a water slide, a water volleyball net, uh, as well as the current channel. Uh, and so uh, that gave us an outdoor, an indoor outdoor option. Uh, but then we also, as a baseline, just wanted to see what the, uh, what an indoor option only could look like. And, and realizing that the, the majority of our community feedback had asked for that outdoor seasonal recreation, uh, but we felt that the question would at least come up, what, what if we just did an indoor facility that's open uh, year round? And so we uh, married that leisure pool program pool with an indoor lap pool. Uh, so now this would give you 82 degree water and 86 degree water indoors uh, on a year round uh, basis. And so, uh, you know, looking at that leisure uh, program pool, you know, you got those three multi-purpose lap lanes here. You got the end of a water uh, fitness class. Uh, similar here, you have, uh, you know, staging kids on the side of the pool uh, for swimming lessons. Uh, again, you got a variety of spaces here, both the lap lanes and the open water area. Looks like you got a private lesson uh, going on in this range. Uh, and then that indoor six lane lap pool, you know, be great for swim practice fitness lap swimming throughout the day, not just in the morning time, uh, like it's currently at the high school. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we have the five lane. Uh, this is actually a five lane uh, lap pool, but you can see the recreational uh, value and capacity uh, that the, the, you know, that this pool has uh, when it's not being uh, used for lap swim, for water fitness, or for swim lessons. Uh, it really provides a, a great uh, open water area for uh, recreation. So we have our three options. The uh, question that always comes up is, well, how much do these cost? And uh, I'm glad you asked that because I have, I have some information on that. And so uh, the way we look at it is uh, we look at all of the different spaces. So we look at our support spaces, we look at our aquatic center. So we have our, you know, this is for the outdoor uh, option. We have our lap pool, we have our leisure pool. We have <clears throat> play structures, mechanical, we have water slides, we have shade, we have outdoor deck, outdoor lighting, uh, fencing. We need to fence uh, the pool. Uh, we have, um, you know, site construction cost, uh, land acquisition. We have left uh, blank for now because we're working uh, with the out of sight. And then we also have furniture, fixtures, and equipment. So lounge chairs for the outdoor pool deck, rescue tubes, backboards, uh, point of sale, computer equipment, all of those things that uh, you would need to start up the facility. And that gives us a total construction uh, cost, you know, that would be bid by a general contractor to, to build the facility. Uh, but then we also show uh, three separate line items down here. We show an escalation allowance of 5% because we know we're not building the pool uh, today. Uh, COVID has put a little bit of a wrench uh, in that 5%. So we did, we did have to adjust some of our numbers up here uh, to be current and then tack on the 5% for uh, future construction escalation. Uh, we include a 10% design and construction contingency. And then we have 10% uh, for project fees, design team fees, surveys, permitting, things like that. And so, We'll talk about construction cost. If I say construction cost, 
you know, that's this number, what the general contractor would bid. If I say project cost, that's going to be the all-inclusive, all-in number. What is the, the total cost uh, for uh, the village? And so uh, here's just a summary chart uh, of where we are at today with our initial concepts. Uh, so the top line here shows the, the different square foot sizes of the pool. So 10,500, 11,000, and 7,600. Uh, a site requirement of about five acres, a little bit less than four uh, if we're doing the indoor only. Uh, you can see the capacity, you know, we're about 400 for the outdoor only, 448 for the indoor and outdoor, and then about 300 for the indoor aquatics. Uh, and then the, the capital cost range, which is the, the all in number. So we're uh, anywhere from 9.3 to uh, just over $15 million for <clears throat> that capital uh, cost range for these three uh, separate options. I have a couple more slides and then we can uh, stop down for some questions because the next logical question that comes on after how much does it cost to build is how much does it cost uh, to operate? And so uh, we go through a detailed analysis. We have what's called our Councilman Hunsaker Aquatic Research Tool. So we call it CHART. And it helps us to develop uh, charts to show you all. And so we have uh, what we have looked at in terms of personnel, direct facility expenses like repair and maintenance, operating supplies, chemicals. We have the utility demand from electricity and uh, pool heating, uh, HVAC for the indoor pool. Uh, and then we have a programming budget primarily made up of personnel and supplies. And, and we put our concessions uh, in there as well. Uh, we also look at uh, different types of uh, revenue line items. Uh, so we look at uh, daily admissions and swim team revenue and swim lessons, water fitness, lifeguard certification. <coughs> Excuse me, we look at food and beverage uh, as well as rentals. And so uh, we take a pretty comprehensive look at, at what it costs to, and expenses to operate the facility as well as what it would uh, generate on the revenue side. And so uh, we've used, you know, actual salary and, and wage rates for <clears throat> uh, the expense budgets. Uh, and then we've made some assumptions on uh, revenue for uh, the revenue budget, you know, in terms of admission fees. We uh, usually work off what we call a per capita basis for revenue for admissions. And so what that means is at the, for instance, at the high school, uh, you know, you can, you can buy a 15 punch card uh, or a five visit card, a 15 visit card or a 30 visit card. And, and there's a sliding scale. It gets a little bit cheaper per visit uh, based on how many, you know, the number of punches that you buy. And so uh, this morning I have a five punch card for $15. And so it cost me $3 per visit. Uh, somebody that bought a 30 visit card for, you know, $60, they're only paying $2 per visit. And so we marry those, those two. We have a daily rate. We have a resident, a non-resident rate. Uh, we have a, a monthly and an annual season pass rate. And so we marry all those together to get, you know, the average cost that each person pays as they uh, come into the uh, facility. <clears throat> and so what I did was I, I just put together uh, an overview chart uh, that details hopefully a snapshot of uh, the work that we have completed so far. Uh, so we have the, the range up here in the top line of the construction cost versus the project cost. Uh, we have, you know, our estimated uh, attendance, estimated expense budgets anywhere on the outdoor only about $430,000 uh, to about a million dollars a year for the indoor outdoor and the indoor only option. Uh, we have uh, revenue uh, streams anywhere from 378 uh, to 405 to about $605,000. And then what that gives us is our overall uh, cost recovery rate. And so uh, what we have found to date is that the outdoor aquatics would recover <clears throat> the majority of the cost uh, or the high, has the highest cost recovery rate when you compare uh, revenue to expenses. Uh, the indoor option uh, has the lowest cost recovery rate for 
uh, revenue and expenses. And then I put at the bottom just a, a little synopsis of, you know, what, what boxes do each of these uh, options check from indoor to outdoor to year round to seasonal uh, to competition to leisure amenities and then put the capacity there. So uh, you have a full, you know, a full view of, uh, you know, what we have come up with today with the options uh, on the side. And so uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, we'd love to stop down for a few minutes to take any uh, questions that you have uh, either on the community engagement, uh, the capital cost side, the operational cost side. Uh, and I, I just wanted to reiter reiterate that, uh, you know, we're looking at options that can hopefully meet the needs of what we heard uh, that are <clears throat> uh, hopefully right sized for uh, the size of your community, taking into account uh, future growth. Uh, but then also ones that can that can really marry that that indoor uh, and outdoor uh, feedback that we heard, so that we have multi-purpose pools that can serve a variety of aquatic users that can have temperatures that uh, you know meet their needs, um, and then it it might be some some rearranging of the the options to get exactly what we want as we continue to move forward. Uh, as these are still you know in our in our draft form. Uh, but we would expect some pieces to to slide around. What happens if you if you shrink the outdoor and expand the indoor, uh, or vice versa? And so, uh, we'd love to have any uh, questions or comments that you have at this time. Thanks, George. Um, <clears throat> I think the best thing for us to do, frankly, is before we make our comments or questions uh, is open it up to the public. And, and if you have comments or questions so we can hear what you, you, your take on what you've just seen. This is our first time, majority of the board, I saw a little bit of it this morning at a meeting, um, but this is our first time seeing it as well. So I think it would be great if uh, you would be willing to share your feedback with us right now. So if you're, if you're willing. So you can either step, yeah, if you can step up to the microphone and just, you know, give your observations, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent um, as to what you've seen so far. And if you could give your name too, that would be great. Um, yeah, my name is Meredith Glick and I live by the middle school and my family, we moved here about seven years ago. And I do greatly support the idea of having a community pool and putting it on the referendum at least. Um, we always go to Middleton usually and we've joined Harbor. Um, and I, I especially support the idea of an outdoor facility, but something indoor outdoor does sound like there is a need for um, maybe with the swim team, but also for a leisure pool and swimming laps. I mean, I would love that. I tell my kids swimming is a life skill and have emphasized the importance of knowing how to swim. So I do think it's something that our community needs. Um, I'm interested to hear that it's 40% don't have, in the community don't have access to a pool. So I, is it, or is it 40% or you said a little less? I've it was less than 40% have access to one of the neighborhood pools. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm interested. I've always wondered what that number was um, or if that includes like the new development too. But I do think there's a need um, in our community, so. My kids are like 11 and nine, so they definitely would love, would love something. Thank you. Others? Um, hi, I'm Greg Lake. Um, I'm actually the head coach of the local Wave Swim Club. And um, I understand from the perspective of, I mean, I would speak now from the perspective of the swim team. Yes, we would love more water, more swim team. I mean, you're not going to tell us, you're not going to find us saying no. Reasons why, um, it was pretty clearly stated, time is short that is available. And we are growing, we are almost done growing. I mean, we can't grow anymore. Where we, we're out of room, we're out of space. We do rent outside of town already um, on certain occasions and certain times. We would love not to do that. Um, we'd love to stay in town. We'd love to grow. Um, Competitive wise, swimming Madison area was ranked in the top 10 or something in the country, the metropolitan areas of numbers of competitive swimmers. 
So there is a need that was a, done a few years ago. Um, and that's mainly that the summer league is huge in the Madison area. And one of the first things I noticed when I moved here four or five, four and a half years ago was there was no summer league here. And I found that pretty astonishing knowing how big the summer league program was in the area. I think that is a huge uh, revenue and growth aspect of, this, of aquatics. Um, knowing just a lot of the lap swimmers at the pool on a different aspect, I know they would, would really like some more time, not even just, you know, Matt and triathletes, just your occasional person wants to stay in a little bit of shape. They would really like to have a little more time that isn't at 5.30 in the morning. Um, so from that aspect, I mean, we are fully behind it. You know, we would, as a club, would love to, if there's a public private option to help try to fund part of it, that would be an option we would definitely look into helping um, or trying to at least. As a parent, um, I have an 11, a 12 year old and a 15 year old. And that was something that they, in the summers, always like, where can we go swim? Even though they're swimmers, they still want to go swim and just hang out without driving, you know, half an hour, I'm waiting in for them, et cetera. So my two cents, thank you. Thank you. Others? And some people here that tonight, I know we're part of some of the focus groups um, and groups that were part of um, coming together with some ideas for the community. So if any of you wanna share your experiences with that, that would be great, Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen, would you like to speak? <laughs> oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, thank you. My name is Jimmy Hernandez Bello. I was part of the, I participated in a couple of meetings in the world group. And uh, yeah, I totally support the idea of having a aquatic center. My family and I moved to Wanaki around three years ago from Las Vegas. So completely different weather, but <laughs> we definitely miss a pool, some, you know, a place where we can go out. I have a, a 15 year old daughter and an 11 year old boy and both love water. And yes, we have that the same issue in the summer. Where do we go? So oh, let's go to, I don't know. <laughs> that's the answer actually. We don't know where to go. And the uh, first time high school, yeah, that's an option. But then, uh, you know, there is no time, there is no room. And uh, we say, well, we have to wait. When we first were invited to this, I was so happy because, uh, okay, we can bring uh, our opinion to the table. We have friends from, uh, mostly of our, our friends are Hispanic and uh, they also like the idea. And I cannot speak for all of them, but at least from my from closest friends and they, they have kids, uh, you know, young kids and they totally support the idea of having a place in town where to go and especially having different uh, you know price points like yeah maybe they cannot cannot pay a lot but they would like to still to participate maybe there are other friends that they say yeah i have a pool at home but still i have my, my kids they want to hang out with friends and they don't necessarily have to go to my pool they can go to a place where they gather all together and they can have fun. So I think overall, whatever the solution is gonna be, if there is a solution, it's gonna be beneficial for everybody. And I like one of the points there, that is we have to plan for the future. One of the members mentioned that. And I think that if this project comes along, it has to be a project that supports growth for the next five to 10 years. So we don't find ourselves in the future and say, hey, we didn't plan it well. So I think it's the right time to, to do that. But yeah, thank you. That's my comment. Thank you. Well, I kind of am wanting to make sure that they're gonna be a warm water pool for both wellness and recreation. The, the people in my age group are having to go outside the community to use warm water pools. And a warm water pool has to be accessible year round. In fact, that's when the biggest use is. And the thing of it is, as people age, it would be nice if they could be closer to home. And doctors are always recommending that uh, water exercises are great for 
people that are trying to rehab. And that was the, the wonderful benefit at the village center that I had never ever thought about. I see people coming in there who are rehabbing from knee surgeries and back surgeries, and it's wonderful. And it also, you know, I think Wanakee is losing a sense of community in that we've got the inner circle and then all the suburbs. And there's not a chance for a lot of people to meet if you don't have kids in school. And something that can serve the, the whole community would be wonderful. And we can see that's what's happening here at the library. And I like the point about that we really have to plan for the future. And this library has done that. You can just see that in its vastness. And at the Village Center, we could really have used more because it's so popular. So plan for the future, include warm water things, <clears throat> and uh, encourage everybody to participate and work together. Thank you. Others that were maybe on the committees, I don't know who all was on them necessarily, so. I'm Susan Rather and I, I was part of the committee. Um, I had a 10 year old 21 years ago when the referendum was voted down. So I've been disappointed for a long time. Now I'm getting more to the senior so I can imagine an exercise pool. But when, uh, as part of the committee, when I saw the survey results, I, I thought they were all over the map. So how could the community possibly come together on an option? But uh, I think George and his firm have done a fabulous job with the hybrid indoor outdoor and trying to satisfy um, practically all of the options. So I'm, I'm hoping that that's an option that the village can get behind this time. Thank you. Any others? All right, with that, um, I will share a few, few, few comments first, and then I'll turn it over to the, the board members if, if they have any comments or questions. And as we, get, as we go through this, you're all welcome that if you have questions for George, um, they were really easy on you right there, George, in my opinion, that you didn't really <laughs> even get any hard questions. But um, I've, uh, I've been in support of having a pool. I've never come out and said, I need to have a pool in Wanaki. I'll just pure and simple. I'm not a swimmer. I don't like cold water, Mary Ellen, so I'm with you. Um, I'm actually even more into the, the hot tub type of water versus versus any warm water that we're talking about. Um, my kids are gone. Um, they're, they're grown and moved out, moved away. So to me, I don't, I don't have a horse in the game, so to speak at this point, other than I look at what does our community want and how can we do things that are gonna help all the people in our community. And I think a community pool is that, just like the library is that as Mary Ellen mentioned, just like our village center is that. Our schools are that for our children. There's areas that people can go commune and um, enjoy one another and have fun with it, learn from one another. All those things come in with each thing like this. The only thing, the thing that really sits in with me as we decide on this is I, I see Lord I did this. I was in Columbus. Columbus has a pool, um, smaller communities than us, quite a bit smaller. And the differences in Wanakee and what we're gonna battle, I think as a board, is we do have a village center. Most communities don't have that. So we have that on our tax roll and we're paying for that, which makes the pool a little bit more difficult. But we made a choice as a community with a referendum to build that village center. Our library, um, we, we had a library and we've expanded to this facility to meet the needs into the future. Our former library just couldn't expand and we just didn't have the capabilities to do anything with it. This site, uh, a lot of people may not even be aware, can expand that way still. So there's actually room for growth for this facility, even in, in the condition it is, which is, this is a large facility right now. So I have some questions for George, but I'm gonna keep mine and I'm gonna let the other board members talk because I think it's important that I not influence in any way all of their decisions and what they want to talk about. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Sam for his comments first. George, I do have one question for you. 
those numbers that you have up there for the project cost, that does not include anything like parking lots or anything like that. Uh, it does include, does include it does include parking, uh, site construction. It does not include uh, land acquisition, uh, but it does include everything that would be needed to support the aquatic facility, uh, assuming normal conditions. Um, you know, which means that you don't have groundwater right there, or we have a project in uh, Arizona right now where just to get natural gas to the site is going to be three hundred thousand dollars. Um, and so it doesn't include little outliers like that, but it does include all the costs associated with the facility being up and running. All right, thank you. And I'll just say that I would like to see some sort of aquatic facility happen. Obviously, as a younger person in this community, I always had to go elsewhere for my aquatic activities. And I would hope that future generations would not have to do that. Um, I guess my my opinions on the pool. I came from uh, I was an early guy at Southbridge. You know, I grew up with a pool in Southbridge, and my kids were fortunate enough. I think for what it's been there, probably eighteen years or somewhere around there. Uh, the one thing I see about pools, even the areas in town that that have pools, it's great for kids up to about fifth grade. But we talked about that forty percent who had access to those pools. By the time they're in fifth grade, they quit using the neighborhood pools. They don't wanna be around mom and dad. They wanna be around their friends. I grew up in Columbus, which had a pool. And the people would tell you from, you know, as a kid, all the way through high school, some of the best times they ever had in their life were at the community pool. I mean, it really brought, I think, the community together, friendships together as kids. So I think that's one thing we miss here uh, I support the, the indoor outdoor combination, you know, even when we did the village center, if we would have had more room, it'd have been a great place to have a, a warm water pool because I think our seniors and I'm there now <laughs> and I'm a physical wreck. <laughs> so to have that opportunity to get in a warm water pool and do exercise, keep active, I think is really important for our seniors. Um, uh, my kids grew up, the hotel had a pool in town. If you wanted to have a pool party, you rented the pool at the, you know, George brought that up. Our hotel today, you can't rent the pool there. There's no place in this town for kids to have a winter pool party, which is kind of a neat thing when you're, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine years old. So I think that provides another option. Um, and again, I think, you know, people have this concern that, well, you know, all the people that live in Southbridge or Kilkenny and these people that have pools, they'll never support this. I pay for a pool membership every year. My wife uses the pool and, and my kids are gone. I don't have a horse in the game anymore either, but I think it's so important for all the kids in this community. Because like I said, after fifth grade, they'd all go to that community pool and hang out and enjoy the summers. So, I mean, I support this uh, mixed combination. Again, my wife, she's a lap swimmer. She used to swim at the high school a lot. You know, she's getting to be my age almost now. She goes, I'm not waking up at 5.30. The water's too cold. It's too crowded. And so we take all these people that really wanna stay active we just shut them out. They don't have a place to go. And so I think this is a real big step for the community. And it's hard because we, we aren't a community that had a pool. But I think the first slides that George showed us, if you looked at the communities, every community around us, they all have aquatic centers and pools. That's one thing we're missing here. And I think it would really help, you know, I don't want to say complete the village, but you know, really give us opportunities for people to get together, as, as Maria Ellen said. No, no, go ahead. Okay, I, um, when I was, had four young sons in the 1980s, I headed a pool project. I was the chair of the wave. Uh, it's heck to be ahead of your time. 
It really is because we, we, we had a lot of people that were interested, but the board, they really, they really weren't interested. I'm really excited to see a pool project get this far and for board members to be interested in it and excited about it. I would like to see something that will meet the needs of the community. I don't know exactly what it is. I mean, I guess one of the things in the back of my mind is location and finding a location that will be accessible to everyone, whether you have parents at home who can drive you to the location or not. Um, but I'm, I'm in support of a pool, providing it goes to a referendum, and that's what the but that's what the voters want. And so I hope when it goes to referendum, a lot of people turn out and it is voted for. And so we need to make that happen. It's, it's as far as I'm concerned, it should have happened a long time ago. I like the idea of the indoor or the indoor outdoor combination. Uh, I just want to make sure we make it big enough because I don't want to scrimp on it. I think we deserve it. I think uh, our people deserve it. I think we can afford it. And uh, the sooner the better, but yes, a referendum, please. Yeah, I'm glad that we're um, taking this referendum. I think that's a good community decision. Um, I echo what Phil, I think if we're gonna do anything, including the indoor, like, our location in the world. And then also just like all of the programs and the people that need pool aquatic services, I think indoor meets those. Um, I hated swimming the majority of my life. It's been a past few years. I've come to enjoy it. Um, and so I, I, as I feel no personal stake in this, but um, I think it's such an important, it's a lifelong sport. Um, my most recent experience with swimming has been with um, Special Olympics. And I think it's a really great to see how swimming and aquatic facilities can really create um, like such inclusive recreation that really can't be found in other sports. So I think that um, should hopefully be a big part of this. Um, I've had to drive, my friend and I drive um, kind of around to different pools to try to find a aquatic facility that meets her needs often. And um, year round, especially it's, it's hard to find. So, um, I think, you know, as much as I hope the community, you know, whatever project is really what they want. Um, I hope we, um, uh, try to make the voices that maybe aren't coming on the referendum, the youth, what they want people that, um, maybe are underserved in other aquatic facilities. Yeah. Thank you for all your work. Yeah. So that was all great. However, um, for us to put a question for referendum, uh, we have to make a decision. We probably won't have a referendum that we have different choices like this, I'm assuming, but maybe that would be the route that may be what we decide to do. So we have to figure out that component out. Our biggest challenge, and I had kind of, uh, I don't want to say forcefully, but it's the first time I kind of put a, hey, I want this done to our village staff. And Sue's smiling. I can see it under her mask right now because I said, I'd like this to be on referendum for April of next year. And that is a pretty monumental task, um, frankly, that I put on to really it was Sue and Todd. And, and then Renee has to deal with the financial component of this. And I, I just want to point a couple things out. Um, since I was in a meeting this morning, so I got a little more detail than everyone else at the table here. So if you look at the indoor outdoor complex, which seems to be fairly well supported by our board members at this point, the operational costs are considerably higher to do that. And that's gonna cause um, a little bit of a more of a budget headache. Um, I don't know how else to describe it, Renee, you might have a better term for it, but it's 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 a little bit more challenging with our budget, with our levies and all the different things that would go into this. So as we go to the taxpayers, um, it's going to be important that we're able to convey 
this is what our costs are going to look like for this type of facility. Not only the um, payment for the facility itself, but the operational. And the operational is really the more challenging one because we don't know that right now for sure. We have guesstimates of what will happen. And as you see, if going from an outdoor to the indoor outdoor, uh, it's significantly more per year to operate. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, George, in figuring out those operational expenses, that's including the revenues coming in and then what we are going to need to additionally pay um, for the facility, for, for the operating expenses, correct? Uh, correct, so on uh, the outdoor only, you know, you're looking at about a $50,000 a year subsidy on the indoor, outdoor, uh, you're, you know, a little over $400,000 subsidy. Which is significant um, for, for people. And we have to be all wary about different budgets that are within our community. Um, as you have people who have very strong means and you have people that not so strong means. And, uh, you know, this is gonna impact all those folks technically, but those who without as, as strong of means, it's gonna affect more so. Um, seniors um, could be impacted by this, uh, but I hear on the flip side of that, seniors want warm water and they'd like it to be in the, <laughs> be able to use it in the winter months. That's the more expensive option, as you see, um, as we go through this. And I had requested um, from Sue and George, um, we had a meeting today, um, this morning, in regards to a bubble going on this. A bubble is gonna be more cost effective than a brick and mortar structure. Um, is it better? Don't know that yet. We're still working through those kinks. Um, the most important thing in here is everybody's safe, right? Everybody agrees if we put a pool and that's, that's a huge deal is safety for all. Um, air quality, all of those types of things. We wanna make sure that whatever type of facility we build has great air quality if it's indoors um, with everything. We want it to be something that's gonna last. Um, as Phil kind of mentioned, or several of you mentioned the ability to expand. Well, not only the ability to expand, but something that's gonna last a long time. Um, that, that's going to be key with as we, we go through these decisions. But I'm 100% in favor of this is going to be a referendum thing. This is not, um, and I, of course, you guys can vote a different way, but I'm fully supportive of this being in referendum um, as we go. I think that uh, for the community at large, um, they need to kind of get educated. There's gonna be a lot of people, as you can see the size of the room tonight, um, we need to have people understand what is going into this, what all the benefits are of having a pool, what the drawbacks may be of having this, um, all those things. Cause right now it's, it's, it's out there, but people don't really have all the facts. And when, you, when we go through this, it's our job as a board, as a staff, as a community to educate one another. So those, it, it's been interesting for me to see um, this is your baby. This is my baby, apparently. I, this is not my baby. Um, it's been interesting to hear um, people say, why well, wasn't no on George's survey? Well, that's the referendum. You'll have a chance to say no. But really, those people that are saying no, what are they saying no to? Just the fact that just the idea of a pool? Or do they get the facts about what it actually is first before they say no? All right, it's easy for us to say, everything's easy to say no to, okay? It's harder to say yes in a lot of situations, but that's, that's what I'm trying to emphasize tonight for both us as a board, but for the population in general, all of our constituents, they look at the numbers, they hear what we're doing and watch and pay attention and learn. But most importantly, ask questions, okay? If you don't ask questions and you will go on Facebook or you go on some sort of social media public, you're gonna hear people say different things. Some might be right, some might be wrong, but do you wanna be hearing, getting information that's wrong? I think we hired, we say it wrong, but we hired George's team and um, Councilman Hunsaker. I have a hard time saying it, I'm sorry, I just do. Um, we hired them for a purpose. Um, I have no expertise in water. I don't think anybody on our board has expertise in water. 
in water parks, not water parks, but aquatic facilities. Why would the population not want us to have that? So they can say, here's what our needs are. Here's what your wants might be. But if you want those wants, it's gonna cost X amount of dollars. Some of the features that he showed tonight, um, I think the committees were probably versed in those, yes? All the different amenities. We saw a few things in here tonight. Um, what we're actually gonna come and end up on for what's going on in the referendum, that's, I think, our job moving forward. I really wanna get it to the, to the April referendum. I just don't know if we're gonna have the time to effectively do it and effectively educate our population between now and April. And those of you who are excited, I'm, I'm, I, I'm still gonna hope, hold out hope that we can get it done. And, and Todd and Sue know that I want this, but um, to be on the referendum, if it's a no, guess what? We've spoken, the, the community has spoken. If it's a yes, that's great. Now we know where we're at and how we're gonna move forward. Then Renee gets to figure out how she keeps her hair in her head. Sorry, Renee, I, I, it, it, there, this, is a, this is a thing that is, is faster than we had planned. Um, I think originally it was around 2025 or six um, in the budget. So pushing it forward into 2022, 23, that's a big difference um, from a budgeting standpoint. So Renee, I don't know if you're, you wanna even talk tonight about this at all, probably not. Um, yeah, but we're gonna, we're gonna absolutely need people to ask questions and give input. And it, whether it's bad input, and I shouldn't say bad, if it's negative that you're not for a pool, that's okay. We need to hear those things. Because if there's a good reason that you're saying that we shouldn't have this pool for this reason, we may not have thought of that, all right? And nor has other people that may be before it. And it might change somebody's opinion or mind for or against. We don't know that, but we need to be out talking about this and, and getting the, the word out. Um, George, can you talk a little bit about maybe, we talked about the domed option that I just talked about, the bubble. <clears throat> that cost point comes, or that price point comes in probably a couple million dollars less. Is that about right? Correct, so there's several different types <clears throat> of uh, pool enclosures or non-traditional uh, natatorium buildings. And so uh, what you see at the high school is what I would define as traditional. It's got uh, brick and mortar, some windows, has full HVAC system, um, but there are other options to enclose a pool. Uh, some of those allow for a pool to be uh, indoor in the wintertime and outdoor in the summertime. Uh, a couple of those options happen uh, with a retractable uh, roof structure. And so you have panels in the middle that can retract down. And so you can, even on a, a seasonal day, you can have a, you know, have an open air uh, facility. <clears throat> One of the companies is actually called Open Air and that's what, that's what they uh, they do is manufacture buildings that can be semi indoor or fully indoor and then what I would call semi outdoor, you know, you, know, you have panels, but you still have walls around you. Uh, but then uh, we also have uh, inflatable uh, dome enclosures, uh, or uh, you mentioned a bubble. And so what that is, is it is a uh, fabric structure that you might see over uh, a practice football field in the winter time or tennis courts or what indoor soccer facilities sometimes have. And you uh, put it up in September over the outdoor uh, pool complex and then you take it down in May. And so you have a indoor pool in the winter time and then you have an outdoor pool uh, in the summertime. And so those are significantly less uh, in capital costs than a traditional uh, natatorium. Uh, but then again, you have, uh, it's not a permanent structure. You have to replace it, you know, every uh, 15 years, you have to spend operational dollars to put it up and put it down. Uh, historically, the air quality has not been as good in one of those as uh, in a traditional uh, natatorium. Uh, but again, it, it has, it's a, it's less of a cost. And so it is the, uh, you know, the least uh, amount of capital cost to to get an indoor uh, pool, but it, it does come with some, uh, you know, 
some there's a there's a pros and cons list uh, that can be said for all of the different types of natatorium enclosures. So one of the questions I was wondering if anybody was going to ask is where is this going to go? And I still haven't heard that one. I thought for sure that microphone was going to be where is the facility going to be located? So right now we, we don't know. Um, we've been in contact with several landowners, none of whom have committed yes in any way um, to it at this point. Um, we do have different sites potentially. Um, Sue, are you okay with me talking about sites? Okay. Um, so ideally, um, we want this to be accessible, I think as Nyla brought that up earlier, to as many people as possible. Um, the issue with that is where's the land that's gonna be easily accessible um, for everyone? That's, that's a challenge. Um, in our downtown, we don't have just spaces available that we need five acres, four acres, five acres, I think it was, um, just available to us. So as we identify potential spots, one of them is off of Hogan Road, where the hockey facility is, um, right across from it. Um, that, that's one potential site. There's two landowners there, actually, um, that discussions would and are ongoing with. Um, we have the uh, land that we own already um, over off of Waterwheel Drive, right uh, down from the Quick Trip. Um, is another opportunity for us over there. We could look at where the middle school is right next to it. Um, there is land there as well, potentially. Did I say that wrong? Intermediate, sorry, intermediate school. That's right. Near the intermediate school on Woodland Drive out there um, would be a potential. Those are kind of the three, am I missing any of you guys? Sue, did I miss one? Near Prairie Park, correct. That's that's the other one. Um, you know, if, if if in a perfect world, um, if we could have it out right outside the village center, that would be great. You know, that right. <laughs> but we have other things there currently. If it could be um, in a downtown, that would be great. Centered in the, to the community, easily easy access. We don't really have that capability at this time, unfortunately. So. That's really kind of the spots right now that have been identified. Doesn't mean there couldn't be others, just as we've had our discussions um, as far as location, those were the ones identified. You know, one thing I would say about the site, I mean, it'd be great. We could tear down the uh, Oktoberfest grounds and put it in Centennial Park and that might be centralized, but that's not gonna happen. And wherever you do it, it's gonna be on the outside edge of town. And being at the Southbridge pool, trust me, kids, kids a block away don't walk to the pool anymore. <laughs> they get in the car and they drive wherever they have to go. And so wherever the pool ends up, that shouldn't make a difference to anybody in this community because I watch it every day. I don't care if it's Kilkenny or Southbridge. You don't see people walk into the pool. They get in their cars and they drive to the pool. So if it's three blocks away or any of these sites are within a mile, wherever you are in this community. So I don't see how the site location has any impact on this. Do you have any comments right now? Just one comment. Um, I don't necessarily agree with um, the idea that everyone gets in a car and goes to a pool we have um, junior high age children and possibly fifth graders that will want to utilize a pool and their parents are working. And that, that's my concern is, you know, perhaps it's not being, it, it being accessible for them to walk, but perhaps we'll need to get an organization to work to pick up kids in the neighborhood and, and get them to the pool. I think it's something that we need to work on as a community and be aware of that, not everyone has parents home that can take them to the pool and we all have different needs. That's, that's what I was trying to say. 
I, I agree with both of you actually, to a certain degree with your comments there. Um, I think if you watch what we've been doing closely at the village and Sue and Bill know this probably better than anyone, uh, paths connecting our community. Um, we've been working very hard to connect the community with paths. And that would be part of the component of getting children to the locations, um, having access to those paths. You'll see that within the new Heritage Hill subdivision, you know, getting up that way, um, coming through here, right through the library. Um, hopefully at some point getting all the way down to um, where Rex's is, is um, com completing that uh, jar, jog, jog, completing that jog, and even potentially into the new um, apartments uh, by McDonald's, if we can connect that. So we've really gone almost west to east at that point um, across the village. So wherever, wherever this would be. And then of course you've got Woodland Drive, you've got a great path going up and down Woodland Drive um, all the way out to our industrial park. So I do think we're working towards that and we've been working towards that to get our community to have a, a lot more walkability. But guess what those things cost too? <laughs> our two things we're talking about are expensive. Um, the pool's expensive, paths are expensive. And uh, from a budgetary standpoint, you know, we wanna make sure that we keep people's taxes at a rate that is somewhat affordable. There's people that are gonna say our taxes are already not affordable. Um, there's others that really don't pay attention. We've got both those groups um, in, in our community. And I, I think that the combination of what I'm talking about is a, is a big deal. Not only to get to our library, get to our village center, to get to our parks, all that, having that connectivity is a huge, huge thing from a walkability standpoint. But let's be realistic, and that's what Gary, I think, is trying to say. A lot of people drive their children places in our community. They just do. Um, I think I heard, was it Heather? Heather? Was it Heather? I think I heard your name, Heather, right? Was there a Heather? Yeah. Meredith. <laughs> Meredith. Thank you, Meredith. Meredith talked about driving her to Middleton or other places. Um, if parents are willing to drive to Middleton and we can get their kids to walk, they're gonna be happy. But I think that a lot of parents still will drive their children um, if it's a, a good distance that they have to go. Um, I had a conversation today about um, Dane. Dane has a new subdivision going in and Dane, that subdivision is actually closer to the Piggly Wiggly and Wanakee than parts of Wanakee are out on the other side of town. So um, it's interesting um, from what I think from, from the drivability standpoint as in the walkability standpoint or the biking. That's another option you know, that we wanna have, have make sure our kids have. All of these things that I'm talking about right now revolve around one thing to me and that's exercise for our kids and for our adults and getting out and doing things and pools are no different um, with that. You've heard people talk about uh, the medical benefits of it. Uh, the, the one feature that I think is just fabulous, and by the way, I, I wanted to ask you about the lifeguard component of that, is the, the, the walking against the current way of that. That's a huge thing for people, especially people who are rehabilitating, any hips, knees, any joints, that's huge. How does that factor lifeguard wise though? Is that a, a big deal to have? You know, I, hear, I heard Lazy River and I hear, we just really made ourselves expensive with Lazy River from a lifeguard <clears throat> standpoint. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So if you look at, at this picture right here, you know, this, I mean, this current channel, you know, probably goes down to that wall, loops back around. And so, uh, you know, just given how, how this one was designed uh, with, the, with the side lines, you know, you have a lifeguard here, and then you have a lifeguard here that can also uh, guard other parts of the pool. And so we would not see it being uh, taxing on the personnel budget, uh, especially if, you know, if, if it's the morning time and there's, you know, the pool is not uh, busy. You'd have more if it's a weekend and there's birthday parties and younger kids, um, you know, but if it's just adults that are walking against the current, uh, then typically, you know, we, we don't need to overstaff it. You can be efficient and safe. Okay, and you mentioned the water temperatures. What do you see for the water temperature on the out, if, if you have the outdoor indoor, what is the outdoor pool gonna be at around 82, I think you said? Usually 82 is a good number. Uh, we design facilities 
uh, you know, and worked with facilities in the Chicago area. And, and typically, you know, they heat it to about 80 to 82 during the, the summertime. Can I ask my swim coach, what's the high school pool temperature? What temperature do they keep the high school pool at? 82? I just hear that that's a that pool's cold, <clears throat> so that, that that's why I asked the question. So, yeah, and I think there's a difference. Yeah, indoor versus outdoor. Yep. Okay. I'm wondering, Chris, because we're talking about, you know, the referendum and the timing of all this. Is this something maybe at our next board meeting, would Renee be able to kind of go over the financials with us, maybe for this bubble option? And I think as a board, at least if I listen to the board, I know Bill's not here, but it seems like the indoor outdoor option seemed to be a pretty popular one. What I'm trying to do is how do we how do we narrow this thing down so we can make a decision so we do have time to sell you know sell our choice i don't want to wait another month to try to get to figure out what the choice is and then not have time to sell it so based on sue saying january 18th is the deadline is that correct is the deadline to set the question for the April election. So based, so based on that, in essence, we have three board meetings left before then. Correct. Um, I think it would be prudent for us to have it on each one of our board meetings for the next three. But I also think it's important to have a listening community session like this again, but we need to get it out to get people here. Um, so they can hear about it, because the the we we if we get it on the 18th, I think we have a board meeting. 17th, 18th, it's it's right there. 18th because of Martin Luther King Day. So it would be the 18th that we have our um, meeting that we'd have to go with it. We'd then have the months of um, February and March to educate the community um, on all the particulars of this, including the budget and getting information out there. So is it doable? I ask you, Sue. Still working towards that goal. <laughs> George, how, what do you feel about that? Uh, yes, we have uh, time and capacity to make adjustments as needed or to explore uh, other scenarios you know, such as the, the different types of uh, building types that we can look at. So we definitely have capacity to support you all on that. So once we've decided, do you put together or does the um, contractor put together the actual what it's going to look like? Like you're giving, you know, kind of a general picture of what the pool lays out layouts are, but what we would have inside and everything, is that something you guys take care of? Or is that something that the contractor takes care of. Uh, so once the project would move uh, toward the technical design phase, uh, we have one, usually four separate uh, pieces to that puzzle. Uh, the first is what we call programming or program confirmation. And it really depends upon when the process starts. Some of our processes start uh, directly after the feasibility study, funding is secured, you move forward. Uh, we know the program, so we'll just confirm it. Other times there, there's a little bit of a lapse. Sometimes it's, it might be six months before we start design. And so we just take a, a quick look back and say, is this still what we, what we want? By that time, we'll have a site as well. Uh, so we'll secure the program. Uh, then uh, you, know, you would hire a design team that would be led most likely by a building architect uh, who would uh, have an aquatics uh, design firm like ours as a subconsultant, plus they would have a, a civil engineer, 
a mechanical electrical plumbing engineer uh, to design the entire building and the systems. We all have our little niche market. And so our, our firm designs the pool and the pool systems, uh, but we don't, we don't design the electricity to run the pumps. And so we coordinate with the MEP to, to bring electricity to the pumps, but we would all work toward a schematic design, design development, and then full construction documents uh, for the facility that would then be uh, bid out for a general contractor to bid on and then uh, construct the aquatic facility. Okay, so that was very good detail. How long does it take to get to that point? Because what I'm thinking is if we're talking about this to our public and we're putting it on a referendum on the 18th, when do we, 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 we need marketing pieces and information for the public at that point? so they could become educated before the vote. How do we, help me with that part of it. I'm just saying, it's, it's probably eight months to get to that point of designing. If you had an outdoor facility, I'm just thinking that, <clears throat> I think the referendum that we put out is gonna show that here's the indoor look of the facility and here's the outdoor look of the facility, this many lanes and this kind of issue, but I'm not, Sorry, uh, I'm not so sure you're going to have a building design at you know in the next two months even. So I think this is more just kind of concept of here's the layout of the facility. I don't think we're going to see a building design. Yeah, so we would, uh, and we can enhance the the graphics that we've done. We can do uh, you know three dimensional. Uh, renderings, but usually what, what would be used in that marketing effort would be uh, conceptual designs like we've shown that show the, the spaces and the types of pools, but it's probably not going to look exactly like that uh, when the facility opens after the, the design phase. One question for the board is, um, if it's important to get a referendum in, in April, the question might be, is that is that the first of perhaps what might be a couple of iterations of a referendum process? I mean, we could have we could have some answers. Um, we could we could ask uh, a general question to the extent that we have information for to gauge a, a, a very clear answer from the electorate uh, and then take that to the next step. We could have a progression of referendums if you think that if if you're that certain on on april we could look at it as a progression okay all of you in attendance tonight so you've heard us talk now and give our little statements on different things i've talked more than everybody else unfortunately but um do you have any comments back um, to what we've said agree disagree um and I'm looking for some feedback as well. Um, all of you are here. This is your opportunity, which I think is great. Andrea Ashmore, and I think that what I'm hearing in the room is that people want the combination indoor, outdoor. And for the selling point, there's something for everyone. If you go outdoor, you're going to have a little old lady saying, hey, we don't get water exercise or lap swim. Um, so I think, you know, it makes sense. Probably one of the hardest things is putting a dollar figure on there, like how much does this affect my taxes? So, um, and I, one of the other things which may or may not come into play is if the school district is doing a referendum at the same time, which, I mean, there's, there's needs there, there's needs here. So hopefully it'll work out. But I appreciate everybody that put the work into this. It's, this is awesome. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mick Kelsher, and I'm in total support of doing something here. The indoor outdoor seems like a really great idea to me. Uh, but what, in regards to the referendum, I don't think having multiple referendums is a good idea. I think we need to go in with something, and you need to be able to tell the, you know, you've got the building costs. Another big one is going to be this land cost. And I think that is going to be very important that you have, that we tell the people where it's going to be. 
because I mean, I don't know, what are we looking at? A million dollar acquisition cost for five acres in town? I mean, that's gonna be a significant cost that we can't blow by. Thank you. Go ahead. Meredith, quick again. Um, I think it's helpful. I mean, I do have all these questions and I know on social media, I've debated almost every summer when someone's like, why isn't there a pool here? Um, some people are really come out and say how they're very concerned about the increase in their taxes and every dollar matters. Um, I do think it's important to, it, it'd be really helpful if the board can, can back this idea. I think that would be beneficial to our community and to also continue to sell it as something long-term, something that is going to grow and, and represent all the needs of, of people in our community. So I just, I, I just want, I think it'd be helpful if the board could back this somehow officially or something that might be, can help convince people too. Thank you. Go ahead, Nyla, grab your microphone. I'm thinking for this to go to referendum, we need to have as much information as we can. Um, we need to have uh, location and total cost for the project. I mean, approximate, I know we're not going to have it exactly. Um, let's see, location, cost, and um, we're talking about the indoor outdoor, that's of course important too, and all the amenities. But when I voted on referendums in the past, the more information I have, the more likely I am to support it. So, so. Um, I guess I have two questions or one comment question about referendum. Um, would like voter turnout be kind of a, stake in that, you know, I mean, we have a big statewide fall election, um, just people maybe more engaged than April elections. So I'm not sure what those numbers look like, um, if that's part of the process. Um, I, I, my next question is, I don't know, do other, sorry, I'm trying to <laughs> remember, the like public part, the public private partnership, is that like, at play here. I'm not familiar with how the ice pond was built or if we have any like ongoing involvement in the operations um, and if other communities have some sort of collaboration with that and if that would also impact the referendum or if any decision making would then have to come from partners. Yeah, so I'll speak first. The, <clears throat> uh, we do see a lot of uh, public private or public nonprofit partnerships uh, in our work. Uh, I would say most of our work is municipal work, 90 plus percent. Uh, but with that being said, when we're working with municipalities, we often talk to other uh, user groups like the swim team. Uh, maybe it's a, uh, a local uh, nonprofit. It could be the, the school district. Um, we've done a lot with uh, YMCAs where they partner with municipalities. Uh, so there uh, definitely could be some opportunity there uh, to explore uh, what that might look like. We typically see that public-private or public nonprofit partnerships fall into the category of land, capital, or operations. And sometimes <clears throat> uh, we've seen a city donate the land, a school district build the pool, and the YMCA operate the pool. Uh, so we've Sometimes it's each one takes one of those, and sometimes it's a, a collaboration on operations, and the school district provides subsidy for the competition pool, but then the city funds uh, the outdoor water park. And so there are a lot of different options that could be explored in that case. And uh, Aaron, that's a good, it's a good question, and that it leads to some of the complexity that we've been working through. Um, we certainly have at a staff level uh, considered partnerships that could be part of the solution. Um, none has risen to the level um, to the point where we can present uh, even good concepts to you. So we're not, we're not there yet. Um, and to imagine that we'd be at a point to feel really confident in um, delivering a public-private partnership solution to you by January 18th so we can decide on a referendum question, I think it would be an impossibility. Um, 
with time, I see potential. Um, there are interested parties that have approached us at a staff level, um, but again, it's very early in that process. I just have a question. I don't understand. I'm just not familiar with how, what needs to, what is the best way to, what information needs to be provided on the referendum, referendum so it is to have its most likely chance of success. I think that's kind of what you were dealing at with. I mean, like if it's, does it have to be known it's a public private at that point? I mean, I just don't know the answer, but, or is it just overall funding? And then if we get one and it's less funding, is that good? I mean, you, I would think so, but. Um, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll admit we, we, we don't have a village clerk on staff at the moment who are, is the professional position that tends to, <laughs> tends to be the expert on referendums. But what I might suggest uh, and suggest to the village board for your next meeting, uh, I guess that's a week and a week and a half or so from now, we could be prepared to talk very specifically about um, the approach to referendums, um, uh, perhaps with e even some additional thoughts on how we might approach a question based on what we know now. Um, we don't have that available for you today, but maybe that would be a reasonable next step in a week and a half to vet that out a little bit further. Um, we can also give you further information on just the referendum process to Aaron's question about um, voter turnout and that impact. Um, we can be prepared with more information on that if you'd, if you'd like that specific discussion. I, I, hear, I hear us trending that way, so I'm suggesting that we could have that as an agenda item. Yeah, I think that would be wise. George, one question I had, the numbers we've been shown, cost, how different are they now today than they would have been five years ago? Uh, we typically see about, <clears throat> or have historically seen about three to 5% uh, of inflation uh, per year. Uh, with that being said, the past year and a half, it's, uh, some has been a little bit higher just depending upon the uh, different types of equipment, steel, concrete, uh, things like that, but uh, historically, it's been about three to five percent per year. So that's why we plug in that five percent of uh, escalation to account for for one year uh, from the study to the start of the design or construction. I've just seen so much right now in construction being so much more expensive currently. And are you using those numbers, or are you using is that the numbers you're using are today's numbers? Uh, that is correct. Yes. So five years ago, it's probably safe to say this would have been considerably less money. Uh, correct, probably, yeah, 20, 20% less. Okay. Phil, any comments? And by the way, Phil was the person who was driving a, a spray pad for quite some time right now, and he's been very patient um, with that uh, to come with this. So I, I, I wanna make sure you, Get your props for that. Of course, we'd like to have a spray pad. It's fun for you littler guys than me, but uh, I'm in, I'd like us to, uh, at our next meeting, at least plug in some numbers, uh, get a range, get a design that we think we could go with and find a lo location, potential location, so that we could move forward, that uh, we just got to sit down and talk for a few minutes about just that. All right, any other board members have any comments or questions they'd like to make tonight? Any more people in the audience that wanna make any comments or questions tonight? Yeah, when, when you mentioned that we need to, we have to educate the community about this, how do you envision to do that? How do I envision to do that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, what methods or how would you uh, provide that education out to, to the community? Perfect question. Very good question. And we have a diverse marketing committee. No, we don't um, <laughs> within the village. But um, what to your point, that, that's something that I'm sure George or people will help us with with marketing. Um, the village center, when we did that, the library, getting information out to people, it could be through social media, media outlets, um, 
news print of some sort uh, out to people. Um, Todd is really good at making videos. We can maybe send them to a pool and um, or Gabe, um, you know, make a video of you know what the you know what this is all about. Um, that, that might be something that we can do as part of that. So I think that's probably my answer right now. I don't have uh, specifics because we just got this information too. So you were in, involved in it before I was, really. So um, that's my answer to that right now. Mary Ellen? I just have a question if there, how many referendums are going to be at a particular election? Because you want a good voter turnout to get your referendums. So if you have too many referendums, I don't mean just about the pool, what the school might have on or what. So too many decisions to be made. I agree. And I think you'll see, if, if we can get this in April, that's my goal. It's been <laughs> my goal for some time um, to get this in. Uh, I, I don't know where the school's at with re their referendums, but I agree if you have multiple referendums for different things, it's gonna be a challenge for any of the items on the referendums. So uh, they may not feel that way at the school, I don't know, but uh, I, I think it would be a challenge when you're talking you know, 10 million for this and 45 million for this or 90 million for this or what, whatever those numbers are. I think that can be very difficult for the general public to absorb. So, all right, that said, I need a motion. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. I'd like to thank everybody for being here tonight and taking your time and, and showing interest and be participating for those that were in the committees and things. Thank you very much you for doing that. On the Spanish